was 32 degrees out. Fortunately, we had lots of bodies in the house. I have all my grandchildren with me. I'm Mary Eve, by the way, if you do not know me. Um, Reverend Mary Eve's down from Silver Lake, New Hampshire. And uh, I think I recognize almost everybody. So it's lovely to be back among you. I just left a thundering horde back at my house. We had a, a, an October birthday fest yesterday for my husband, Stephen, who turned 75. And so we had all the grandchildren in the house, ranged in age from 3 to 21. <laughs> the older ones with their girlfriends. And they're all very, very loud. <laughs> so I was quite delighted to climb into my car and say, Oh, I'm so sorry to leave you this one time. I've got to go. I've got to go to work. So welcome to Jack Community Church on this World Communion Sunday. Um, please stay afterward for coffee and conversation and fellowship. Um, uh, I'm sure there's lots to catch up on. This is the beginning of... Um, um, a thing, right? A whole series of sermons, uh, a whole series of services called, called Taste and See, where um, the gospel message will be compared to varieties of foods and beverages. And uh, this first week is bread. I get the honor of kicking off the first week with bread. And there it is. Uh, that is not for social hour. <laughs> Are there other announcements? Are there any announcements this morning from the congregation? Yes? Um, the food pantry is now looking for like combination of soup and mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily together. <laughs> <laughs> any other announcements? Yes? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say something in tribute to one of our members. I mean, walking my dog Axel to buy the church the other day, which I do every day, 10, 20, 30, 40 times. And I happened to just really start looking at the front of the church where the two window boxes, the flower arrangements, which she does with no accolades intended in her heart. And it, it's, it's breathtaking. If you get a moment on your way out, look to the sides and they are gorgeous, as well as she does make other decorations in them. Sure, Frost was over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't blame you, we'll be <laughs> Well, if there are no other ones, yes. Okay. Well, it's going to be average. I have to say thank you to um, Gail, Reverend Gail, and to Fred Tompkins, who suffered through taking his residence from the town. We all spent for the fair Tuesday. And poor Fred got the heaviest person you could ever imagine and very made it through the day. But we thank you very much for all. And it was not a warm, sunny day, as I recall. Yeah, it was a sunny Yeah, yeah. Well, any more accolades? If not, please greet each other.
divorce for his sake. I asked him to leave each other and I'll come last in relationship. <laughs> <laughs> come on, people. Come on and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. This uh, call to worship is a song. I'm going to sing a little piece um, from the Shoah. Uh, I believe it's called Shoah, the language from Zimbabwe. And then you're going to sing a song with me. We'll figure it out. I'm going to sing. <laughs> several years and has her own accounting business. But she is dying. She's had cancer and uh, we thought she was getting better and then all of a sudden everything fell apart. We don't know whether she'll live this week out. Remember her in your prayers. What's her name? I can't think of her last name. Okay. 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 Yeah. That's the problem with being yeah. so. yeah. yeah. You remember her even if you don't remember her name and so will we. Church will hold silence.
gather on the edge of a new day. You can't know what this or any day holds for us, what treasure of sorrow. So we come together this day to share both burdens and joys. Knowing that God has given us to each other for this purpose. That we might endure suffering, overcome sorrow, and rejoice more gladly, giving thanks for it all in the company of our companions. Tony, I stand here on Sunday mornings with this pen in my hand as if somehow by transcribing words on paper I can transmit something somewhere into the world. But I do believe that our positive thoughts and prayers and energy has to make a difference in the world. You know, if we believe everything is connected, and I do, and that God is love, and I do, that kind of energy, your words, your heart's thoughts coming out of your mouth, to my ears, to this hand writing down the names, and sending energy forth, I have to believe it matters. And so in every generation, in whatever ways we know how, we pray together. Now I invite you to lift your voices in the prayer of our heritage, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You'll notice that the order of service has shifted a little bit this morning. Um, that's because I've added choreography to the um, communion service later. And so we've moved the offering up in the service. So I will now invite you to let us make an offering for the work of the church and the hope of the world made fair in all the people's dreams. Our morning offering will be gratefully and fully accepted.
um, as the series Taste and See continues, and it's a little song called Taste and See, which is on your insert. And we're just doing the refrain, we're not doing the verses, it's just the top part of the page. You want to play it through us?
my apologies for the tiny price. Do you want the mic? No, can you hear me? So I had to intro a bit because I have not read this. And she's hard to follow. <coughs> Scripture, Matthew 20, 1 through 16. As Jesus was just telling what the kingdom of heaven would be like, he said, Early one morning a man went out to hire some workers for his dinner. After he had agreed to pay them the usual amount for a day's work, he sent them off to his vineyard. About nine that morning, the man saw some other people standing in the market with nothing to do. He said he would pay them what was fair if they would work in his vineyard. So they went. At noon and then at about three in the afternoon, he returned to the market. And each time, he made the same agreement with others who were loafing around with nothing to do. Finally, at about five in the afternoon, the man went back and found some others standing there. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long looking and doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. Then he told him to go work in his vineyard. That evening, the owner of the vineyard told the man in charge of the workers to call them in and give them their money. He also told the man to begin with the ones who were hired last. When the workers arrived, the ones who had been hired at five in the afternoon were given a full day's pay. The workers who had been hired first thought they would be given more than the others. When they were given the same, they began complaining to the owner of the vineyard. They said, the ones who were hired last worked by for almost one hour, but you paid them the same that you did us. And we worked in the hot sun all day long. The owner answered one of them, friend, I didn't cheat you. I paid you exactly what we agreed on. Take your money now and go. What business is it of yours if I want to pay them the same that I can do? Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Why should you be jealous? If I want to be generous, Jesus then said, so it is. Everyone who is now first will be last. And everyone who is last shall be first. More holy climbing. The name of this little story is what is this? But it occurred to me if I was reading the first reading and then I really read that, I should have called it holy climbing. In the ten days between the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which arrived at sundown last Sunday, and the arrival of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement arriving at sundown this coming Tuesday, lie the days of awe. I just love that. Days of awe. Among our Jewish contemporaries and ancestors, it's a time of turning and of introspection. A time when one turns one's heart toward healing what is broken among us, within us, and between us all. A time of seeking atonement or at one meant of seeking wholeness. It's a time to remember their covenant with God and hope that God will do the same all by the way. Similarly, the Christian churches around the world choose this day to open their communion tables wide, to turn toward one another across man-made boundaries of culture and creed, and to remember the church to seek at one moment with the extended family of God as we understand it. It's not as simple as it sounds. I mean, what would it look like, feel like, smell like, taste like, to really welcome everyone, even your own family members to your own house, if you really welcome everyone at once, given the times we live in, Maybe any time. This is a 
bold and some might say foolhardy invitation. After all, the world church is not a monolith. We do not think alike, look alike, believe alike. God knows even here in our own country, maybe even this little congregation, we disagree, sometimes vehemently, regarding what it means to call oneself Christian. As a universalist slash Unitarian Christian, many people would say, ah, you're drawn out of the circle. You're drawn out. Who is in? Who is drawn outside the circle of true faith? Forgive us this day. Maybe every day we pray. What is it we fear? That there's not enough to go around? Not enough? Not enough what? Enough God? Really? Do we not dare taste and see? To the trust that love is enough? Tough love? Gentle love? Truth-seeking, understanding love? Eyes wide open love that asks more of us than a half smile and a handshake. This morning, I want to suggest that all that work, that love work, can be begin here, here and here. We can set the table. We can practice here. One at a time, two at a time, three at a time. 40 at a time. The church is the place where we rehearse what we want the rest of the world to look like. It's not that you come on your best behavior. You come who, as you are, who you are. You bring who you are to this particular table. And sometimes it's a grumpy curmudgeon. And sometimes it's somebody overflowing with goodwill. And sometimes that's the same person on two different Sundays. We come as we are and we practice the way we want the world to be. Every Sunday morning together we come, we welcome familiar friends and guests to worship, and we trust that there will be enough. Enough love, and enough challenge, enough spiritual sustenance and intellectual stimulation, enough fun and help and trust, enough money in the bank to pay the bills, enough faith in each other and in God to go around. I say we trust all these things. But if we were to be honest with ourselves, we know that there is sometimes a hint of doubt. On the day that sometimes we experience something akin to panic, fearing that in fact there very well may not be enough of some of these things to go around. And then what do we do? I remember the months leading up to the birth of our second child, we were living in a tiny apartment. We had outgrown it with the first baby, but we couldn't yet afford to buy a place of our own. Our living space consisted of a little less than a half of a second, of half of the second of three floors in an old farmhouse. Two small rooms in the back on the main floor and two tiny bedrooms up on the third floor. It was hot, hot, hot in the summer, and cold, cold, cold in the winter, the kind of cold with the frost, it scraped the frost on the insides of the windows in the morning. We couldn't afford a telephone, so we shared a phone with the downstairs neighbors, a situation that was inconvenient to say the least. Having been operating on something like common sense or rational practicality, we would perhaps have decided to wait for baby Eliza. I would sometimes lie awake and worry about whether there would be enough to go around. Enough space and money and food and clothing, of course. But also, I couldn't imagine that I could possibly love a second baby as much as I love. 
Where in the world would I find the image in time to raise a second child? It was one of those sweaty middle of the night fears that you can almost can't name. What if there's not enough love to go around? 38 years later, it appears to have worked out just fine. <laughs> It's not that there weren't plenty of unexpected twists and turns along the way. In fact, I could not have begun to guess then where we would be as a family today. Now that we gather on holidays, as we did yesterday, as a truly extended family of spouses and former spouses and their spouses, and yours and mine and our children and grandchildren, oh my God, you should hear the introduction. This is Jennifer, and this is Ed. Ed is Theo and Oliver's grandfather. No, 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 no. Mary and Seth are the parents of those two. Ed and I have this one, and there's a piano. And there are sometimes as many as 20 people around the table. And so far, there has been enough to go around. I would be less than truthful that I not tell you that this was not accomplished overnight, nor without gnashing of teeth and lending of clothings and tears, without crashing around in the wilderness, without holy whining, without stumbles and forgiveness, and learning how to be a new kind of family. Throughout human history, and to varying degrees, we have had to deal with the very real fear of not having enough to get by. And that fear is heightened when out of scarcity, real or imagined, we must open our hearts and share what we have with others. Now, I want to stand here among you and preach abundance to assure you that God will provide and all will be well. But there's far too much evidence to the contrary for me to do that without at least unpacking these platitudes and examining what they might mean in our century. What does it mean to claim that there's enough for all? Is it a bogus or pie in the sky claim? Is it only what we wish for? What does it mean even here in this place? Well, we know from experience that there's always enough work to do, always enough trouble to share. We know that there's usually enough humor to balance the always enough stress in life. We believe that there's enough love to fill the world, and we fear that there's enough hate to destroy it. We pray that there's enough wisdom among and between all the peoples of the earth to overcome that nightmare of a possibility. But when we get right down to the nitty-gritty, when we get right down to the essentials in life, to water and food and shelter and health care and education and freedom, is there really enough to go around? Or has our human population grown beyond our capacity to adequately care for one another? Are there just too many neighbors to love? In the midst of all these pressing questions, do our religious traditions, do our readings for this morning still have a word to speak to us, a word that will help us find answers for today? The ancient writers of Exodus and Matthew, each in their own way, confront us with God's paradoxical economy, a kind of economy that was once summed up, perhaps unintentionally, by Nick Jagger when he sang, You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. As I read and pondered our readings, the part that kept coming back to me was the question that the Israelites asked when they first beheld what God had provided them in their hungry state in the desert. What is this? What is this? When we look up the word manna, this is what we find, and I quote, this is probably 
probably from Wikipedia, I'm guessing. I don't know. The man of hell for the first time while the Israelites were in the desert, six weeks after their departure from Egypt, in answer to their murmurs over the privations of desert life. During these years, the manna was their chief but not only article of diet. Their herds furnished them with some milk and meat. They had oil and flour, at least in small quantities, and at times purchased provisions from neighboring peoples. The manna had to be gathered in the morning at the, as the heat of the sun melted it. The quantity to be collected was limited to the equivalent of about six or seven pints per person. Though it was probably edible in its natural state, it was usually ground in a mill or beaten in a, in a mortar and pestle and then boiled and made into cakes. Like little oat cakes or pancakes of some kind. The name manna is connected with the explanation mahu, which the Israelites offered on first seeing. This expression, since the time of the Septuagint, is generally translated, what is this? So what they were saying, what rain from heaven was, what the heck? <coughs> that is what manna means, literally. What is this? What is it? And anyway, you translate it, you get the distinct impression that this was not at all what they had in mind when they asked to be fed. I remember the same words spoken by my little ones whenever they were introduced to some new dining experience, like saying, Brussels sprouts, <laughs> or Indian pudding. What is it? It's a question of a suspicious diner. We have certain culturally conditioned expectations in this life, and when they are not met, our first reaction is to feel that we have been tricked or slighted. So often it seems we ask something of God or hope for something from life, and what we get in response to our request baffles us, surprises us, sometimes disappoints, and sometimes delights us. It is not what we hoped for, and certainly not what we expected, but very often it is exactly what we need, even if we can't see it at the moment. I have no doubt that every one of us here can recount a personal story of deep disappointment when we didn't get something we know we deserved or wanted. Or when some unforeseen hardship has robbed us of joy or hope for a time. When life has taken a twist we never expected in our wildest dreams. We are overwhelmed, sometimes for a moment, sometimes for years, and we ask, why me? Why me? We turn and look into the wilderness, into the desert, even as we long to escape from it and ask, what is this? Similarly, I expect we can each and all look back over our lives and remember a time when we asked and wonder, how did I get so lucky? In both instances, the question is really the same. What is this that Providence has provided me with? What is this that God has given me? And what in the world am I to make of it? The Israelites, longing for freedom, followed their God into the desert wilderness, and facing their fear and their hunger, now wondered whether the trade-off had been worth it. In answering their fears, God provided not the bread they had hoped for, but in a serious form of nourishment that required their engagement with the mystery itself. What the heck is this? What am I going to do with this wet, white stuff? Likewise, the early to rise and the early to work laborers in the vineyard may have asked of the landowner when he paid the same wage to those who joined them at the end of the workday, hey, what is this? I worked eight, ten hours. They worked one, they're paying us the same. This isn't what we expected. We worked all day in the hot sun and we deserve more than those other guys. It's not fair. We have expectations of our God by 
help on. We want what we think we deserve. What I love about these stories is they confront us with what abundance is really all about. Yes, there is plenty to go around if you don't afford it. If in fact you give it away and they point out our common human response to that reality and challenge. Fear kicks in and resentment. We don't easily trust the truth of that equation. That there is enough if you don't afford it. But in fact you give it away. Both these stories take the sweet, sweet parable of God will provide and turn it on its head, giving us the complex and humbling fare of paradox. We are left sometimes frustrated and always wondering, wait a minute, what is this? Life happens, and when it does, it calls into question all our treasured assumptions about the way things are supposed to be. If you are a good person, good things will happen to you. If you take care of your health, you will never get that dread diagnosis. Your children will all be healthy and happy and well adjusted. You won't lose your job. Your marriage won't fall apart. Historically, we have looked to our religious faith, to our churches, to help us answer these hard questions, and they have been more than happy to do so, but never to our complete satisfaction. There's always a catch, always one more mystery that our human nature cannot as yet grasp or explain. And so, like the Israelites in the desert, we begin to grumble. We grumble against our elected leaders. We grumble against religion. We grumble against the other, the enemy. Holy whining. We want to lay the blame for our dis-ease anywhere we can. Moses and Aaron told the Israelites and remind us today that all this grumbling about life as they and we know it was ultimately and appropriately directed at their God. Directed at providence. For there's our relationship with God that is to say, our stance within the web of life that we confront in that moment. And it is that larger relationship that needs healing and reconciliation. It's our perspective on where we are in that moment. It's not a once and done proposition, unfortunately. Like any relationship, it is a process in which we approach and draw back, listen, and turn away, hurt, and heal. But what we hope for from our community of faith is a supportive framework to which we can bring our joys and successes, as well as our sorrows, our questions, our confusion, our dismay. And here in the company of others, here at this table, we can begin to make some sense of it all. Not all at once, not always lasting, but a morsel at a time, we can make some sense of it. I think as simple as they sound, there are at least two lessons we can take from both Matthew and the Exodus story. One, life is nothing if not surprising, and whatever comes out of the way, we can and must make the best of it, the best for all. And two, and all things take only what we need, knowing that in life's ultimate equation, in that cosmic economy, that's all any of us, and therefore all of us deserves. Take only what you need for today. That's what that prayer says, give us this day the bread we need. Take only what you need for today, knowing that what you need from day to day will change. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's what I want to do. There are no careful cosmic measurements that guarantee an equal portion in all things to all persons. They just aren't. We will not ever and always have the same amount of anything, not money, nor power, nor suffering, nor grace. But if we are not greedy and fearful, and if we consciously act from a place of kindness and love and compassion, 
compassion and generosity, if we all give what we can and take only what we need, there will be enough for everyone. The owner of the vineyard pays the same wage to everyone who comes to work that day, no matter how many hours each of them actually puts in. But in the real world, at different times in our lives, we will all be the early workers. The first chosen. Likewise, we will all be late to the game and overlooked by opportunity. What we hope and pray is that in the process, we will move as a species, bless you, closer to God and nature's economy. So that no matter where we are in the equation today, there will be enough to go around. And when at times we find ourselves moved more by fear than by love, we hope to remember that when we operate out of that broader definition of abundance, there's even enough forgiveness. When I am small, I hope you will say, I know you're not always small. You are forgiven. For many of us, this need for perspective, for fellowship, and for healing leads us back to church, maybe after years of absence. And what do we get from this community church? Some of us come in lonely and sad, or fond and familiar. Some come in curious and seeking truth. Some come in fearful and wounded. Some hearts full of faith and joyful thanksgiving. But no matter how we are drawn, we all come with hungers. Deep, spiritual hungers and the hope of being fed. Well, a small town community church, where we find various understandings concerning God and Jesus, not only from the pulpit, but in the pews as well, we certainly don't find a regimented diet, nor a recipe for something quick and easy to prepare ahead and eat on the fly. Rather, I might suggest that what we find here is something a little bit like Man, a sweet, mysterious gift from life itself, of which we must ask questions and with which we must experiment, taking into our whole selves so that we may be nourished together and knowing, believing that there will be enough to go around. Now, some among us here have been in this congregation, this community, for several decades. Some for a few years. Some a few months. Some of us come occasionally, and some may have walked through the doors for the very first time this morning, or may do so next week. Whoever you are, we hope that you have found enough for today that you will come again and perhaps choose to walk with this community in the weeks and months and years to come. And remembering the passage from Matthew and the moral of that strange story, what are we to do with that proclamation that the last shall be first and the first shall be last? What does that mean in a community like this? What does it mean anyway? So I want you to humor me, bring your handles, stand up, If you are able, if you are with your hymnals, and to the best of our ability, form a circle that ends up here. Now, I know you're going to have to be in the, some of the crosses that she used to do it, but see how if we can form a circle. Trust me, I'm a professional. <laughs> can we form a circle? And if you need to stay in a few to, to, to hold on and be steady on your feet or steady sitting, that's fine. I just want to see if we can make a circle. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Almost as if we planned it. I said to Gail, can I do this? She said, I don't care. I'm not going to be there. If you get away with it, I'll try it. Who's 
flat. Who's next? Who cares? Each and every one of us. In this wide circle, we have the courage and the freedom to ask, what is this? What is this? And our laughing, loving God replies, taste and see. Sing with me, if you will, number 381, in Christ there is no east or west. And if you need to sit or want to sit, please, by all means, do. And I'm going to turn off my mic so I'm not singing into the microphone. <laughs> Table wide spread 
and universal welcome made real among us. We ask forgiveness of one another. We ask forgiveness of God. And we vow to begin again in this and every day. Now turning to your neighbor, say, You are God's own, human and forgiven. Begin again this day. You are God's own, human and forgiven. Begin again this day. This morning we share the meal that has stayed up in our ancestors across every generation since the time of Jesus. And so you might have let it all come, come of your belief and your unbelief. God's love makes room for it all. Let us give thanks for life. Let our hearts be given wings. And let us keep the feast. Precious mystery, source of all things, gracious and loving God. We give thanks for this company and for all the gifts of life. We praise you, Spirit of Nature, and rejoice in all your works. We remember all who have lived and died and shared this world with us, prophets and healers, ordinary men and women and children, the famous and forgotten. We especially call to mind those who are sick or in sorrow, all who suffer in body and mind and spirit, all who are oppressed by forces of power and privilege, we carry them in our hearts, and we pray for their relief. We remember those of every faith and time who have sought the truth, and pray that all members of the human family may know true freedom, until at last the very ends of the earth are liberated. We give you thanks for the life and example of Jesus, who lights our path toward wholeness in you and in one another. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus gathered around the table with his dearest companions. And after the meal, after all the stories were told, and after all the gentle laughter and the reminiscences of all their time together, the miles they walked, the work they'd done, after all had been said, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and he passed it among his friends saying, take this and eat. This bread is broken for you as my body is broken. My life is broken for you. This is myself, and I am giving myself to you. He took also the wine, and he blessed, and he gave thanks to God for it. He poured it out, saying, this wine is poured out for you as my blood, my life's work is poured out for you. Take this and drink. This is myself. I am giving myself to you. And the breaking of the bread. We remember the work of Christ in this world and our continuing part in it today. And in sharing the cup of blessing, we remember to bless the world as Jesus blessed the world in our own life's work, in our own life's blood. We give thanks for the fruit of the vine and the grain of the earth, which has been transformed by the work of human hands and the element of God's good time. We give thanks for your child Jesus, who framed the work of justice through the lens of peace. May this offering have significance to those for those who partake in it, for the consecration of body and spirit, for the fruitfulness of good works, and for the sustaining of our lives in this community of faith. May the spirit that blesses us with these gifts move in us that we may give of ourselves and bless the transformation of this hour. Amen. So behold, the gifts of earth for the people of earth, the gifts of spirit for the people of spirit, the gifts of God for the people of God. We are all one bread, one body. Take, eat, remember. Take one and pass it on. And if we eat, there's one.
if there was enough to go around. Join in companionship with people who embrace and embody the hope of one humanity and the establishment of your beloved community on earth among the nations. We remember the words of Jesus which instruct us today I was hungry and you gave us, gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. There were little tiny crumbs left. In every act of mercy, of love, of empowerment, in every spark of hope, you are there. May we ever align ourselves with you. Amen. Okay. Let us break bread together on our knees. I think we know it.